Simon. <laughs> Gary Chalk. We know it's real. And Peter Kalamans. Did he make it? Can he get up there? All right. Awesome. Well, we're really glad you guys can get out of bed after all the party you've done and stuff. So. I'm a little confused because uh, you call us the hangover panel, but isn't every panel a hangover panel? I'm just wondering why you singled out this one. No, but it should be. Okay. Um, I was going to start off the morning by asking, what is the strangest damn thing you've seen at this convention? Uh, the guy in the gold lame shorts with the little jewel on the front and the extra padding in the, in the crotch. That was so... Uh... <laughs> I, I was doing a phone interview last night on the sidewalk at, at we went to the dinner and uh, while I was on the interview doing an internet radio interview a guy walked past me he had like a gold outfit with little kind of wings didn't really mean anything but what made the outfit was that he was walking down the street with a shake weight <laughs> and I actually said on the phone I was like hang on guys hang on hang on I gotta tell you about this guy who's just walked past me now that was great, you just heard the DJ and everyone was just laughing at it. That was the weirdest one for me. I mean, I've seen some strange ones. More gross, but like... I did see one hot one on the way home. Oh my god. Oh yes. Oh, I was walking home. Beautiful Asian girl. She must have been like six foot, man. I don't know if you guys have seen her. She had little white wings and a white bikini. Oh, oh so her. So <laughs> I mean, I, you she was a light to heaven in so many ways. <laughs> no, she wasn't weird. No, 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 she was magnificent. magnificent. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can single it out to one, but I like when you see an outfit and for the left you can't figure out what, what the hell it was. You know, you're like, uh, he's got a sword and like a coffee pot. <laughs> come again, then, like, what is it? Like, what is, is the game? Thing? Is it sushi, chef? I'm not sure what you're... I don't know, it's like those guys who walk around with pajamas. What is the deal with that? I, mean, I, that? I know that's an anime cartoon, but I have no idea what it is. But there was a whole segment of guys who just walked around in like, like you know, those uh, oh. uh, robes with pajamas. Bleach! What are they? Uh, yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah. Oh, Hitchhiker. That's what it was. Yep. Uh, there was out, that's a pretty easy costume. I mean, what a cop. <laughs> There was one guy who was sort of dressed all in green, and he was sort of, he, he was sort of like a toad. He was, you know, and he was all sort of crouched and sort of hopping around, and I watched him purposely to see how long that would last. Did not last very long at all. He was up, you know, pretty quickly. But I have to say, I'm up very, very, very high. You know, my room, my, and, and I'm just looking down. Right. <laughs> my, <laughs> it's amazing with the architecture that's space edge enough, but then with all of the outfits, it's like something out of the, you know, Star Wars bar. You know, that was my image all weekend was the Star Wars bar. We're you know, here at the Grand Galactic Assembly. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had any actors who actually dress up? It's very hard for us. We, you know, ha Halloween is not our favorite holiday. You know, we just don't do it. Adam Savage does it. Does he? Does he? Okay. I did it. I did it. Yeah, Han Solo. The hand solo for two days. Nice. Yay. That actually leads into my next question, which is awesome. Um, if you were to return to Dragon Con, um, would you wear a costume? And if so, what? Yes. No. <laughs> I got a hand solo costume that's put in all my closet now. You know, I was uh, I was sitting there watching some of these guys and some of the costumes that they were wearing, and in this heat. I'm wondering, how on earth do they make it through the day? I heard some guy, some guy who sat down beside these guys at dinner, who was... And I'm going, 
man, if, if you're you're in that in that heat and you're sweating like a you know, you're just sweating like a pig. I mean, it's got to be horrible. At the end of the day, when you take that costume off, it's like, no, I'm not going to wear this. <laughs> no, 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 no. It just looks too itchy and too hot. But they look kind of cool, i got to say. But if I was to come here in a costume, I'd probably come as, um, oh, I don't know, Aquaman. I like Aquaman. See, I have a better idea. I think you guys need to tell us what costumes we should wear. <laughs> That's much more interesting. You know what I mean? You gotta go online and vote, and we have to do it. Yeah. I'm gonna shake weight. That's right. <laughs> actually, two. Actually, there's a new thing out now, and I've actually got a video on my phone. It's brilliant. You guys must Google it or, or, or YouTube it. It's called uh, uh, Tug Toner. Have any of you seen it? Tug Tug Toner. That might take you to a different site. It's brilliant. Tug Toner. You know those bands that stretch kind of things? So what this is, it's it's basically like a long penis. About this long. With a ball on the end, and what you do is you put it between your legs. And there's this whole video of this, of course, really muscular bodybuilder dude, and he's tugging, and then he's like, you can get your friend to get one, and you can do it together. So. You gotta see it. YouTube it. Tug Toner. Oh my God! It's coming to you from Ronco. <laughs> this is too early in the morning. I guess I'm way back here. Oh, she has it. Oh, she has the Tug Turner. I knew there was somebody out there who'd buy it. <laughs> she's googling. I mean, she's uh, YouTube. Oh, she's googling it. Oh, you don't have it. Sorry. Right. Put it on the screen. You guys will love it. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you have costume ideas for any of our guests this morning, you can tweet those at SGM Track. We would love to see those. <laughs> Um, my other question before we get into Q and A, you guys can go ahead. You got it. Can't we put it on a camera and put it on the screen somehow? Oh my god! <laughs> I don't know. That's what I mean. Hold the phone in front of the camera. We got to play it, guys. It's so funny. But you got to hear it as well if you can. I don't know if that'll be possible. The tug turner. This will wake you up. Tug toner. Oh, toner. It's what I do every morning. That's it. <laughs> Get those arms with my massive friend. shape. Yeah. Me and Gary, we, we build up those thighs. Look at me. We, I'm a tub toner man. <laughs> actually, actually, I think it's working much more on their personalities than it is on their. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, 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 I said we'll let it take off yeah, yeah. on that for a second. I have one more question. Uh, what's the uh, one tale that you absolutely must tell someone as soon as you get home? <laughs> 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 What happens at Dragon Con? <laughs> Stays at Dragon Con. Thank you. Yeah. Nice stay on that one. <laughs> I, I, I thought that applied to all conventions, and I found out it doesn't. <laughs> I bet it's in trouble. Uh, I think they should change it from Dragon Con to Lineup Con. Yeah. Yes. Man, I've never seen so many lineups for everything. Every day this weekend, and the, I, I think the one thing I'm going to yak about is the parade. The parade was really quite something. The costumes and the groups, that was just amazing. I got a video. I want to ask you guys a question. None of these guys were there last night. I'm sure you were all at the panel yesterday with Rick. And so I just want to get your thoughts on it. I don't know. Now, now hold on a minute. What, what the hell are you talking about? No, 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 no way. I mean, if you really want to know about, you know, me, if you want to know about me, well, then ask me. Don't ask him. Oh, have you ever done a panel with Richard Dean Anderson? Oh. <laughs> I've never. I did my first one with him yesterday. You did? And it's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not going to happen again. Can you repeat that? <laughs> it's not going to happen again. <laughs> well, no, it's fun. But it's fun, but I don't know. I'm not even going to say it. I've, no, I've known Rick since, uh, since MacGyver days and uh, had worked with him back in the 80s. And, 
And so I know what his his sense of humor is. And he's really, actually, if you, you get past that, now hold on a minute, wait a minute, you don't know what, you know, he's actually quite a funny guy. But boy, oh boy. He, uh, he visited, uh, he, he guest starred, obviously, on uh, SGU a number of times. And uh, the, the one time he was on set when, uh, when I was there, me and Patrick Gilmore were sitting on our cash chairs, and I look over and I go, oh man, it's Richard Dean Anderson. And Gilmore's on his chair and already walking over there. And he, so he runs over to him, and I guess he was just so excited. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, he goes, oh, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Anderson, uh, I just want to say thank you. When, you know, when I was nine, you were a chairman of the And um, my dad used to play for the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, uh, I got a picture with you, and you signed the puck. And I just want to say well, that it was just so awesome. And he's like, oh, well, bless your heart. Thanks for coming. And Patrick comes over, and I'm like, really? <laughs> Do you want to make the guy feel older when I was nine? <laughs> what the hell are you saying? Like, what, what? Oh yeah, oh back in the war we used to watch MacGyver. <laughs> when the Hindenburg exploded, that you brought us through that. <laughs> when my grandparents were five. <laughs> you made the difference, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> You guys should all get off stage and run around the crowd now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what we're gonna do. Run off stage. I gotta admit, yeah, the sound was pretty bad and we couldn't hear ourselves, so it was pretty bad. So Rick jumps off and runs down into the crowd. He's like saying, alright, now ask me the questions, now I can hear you. It's very funny. Very sweet. Yeah. But he's looking good, huh? He is looking good. Looking good. I think we're hey, where he lived. I would look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Well, he uses the tongue toner, so that's a thing, you know. When you use the tongue toner every day, you can look like Cliff. And he's it's dead right. sexy. It's only the right arm, guys. So. Did you ever see that episode of Family Guy where, uh, what's his name? The pervert neighbor? Greg Meyer. Where he discovers internet porn. Because yeah. it was brilliant. He comes out his eyes. His eyes are red, but his one arm is just uh, <laughs> and baby. Uh, oh, that's good. Uh, how you doing, Quagmire? Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I gotta say, there, in the Walk of Fame, where we, you know, all the signatures happen, uh, I sat beside Cliff for three days and uh, never again, because. <laughs> Uh, he was right there, and all I could hear were uh, beautiful women coming up going, Hi, Cliff. <laughs> Again? The, I'm sick of this ear. No, no, those were just the leftovers from Jason, because Jason was next to me. <laughs> so I go from Jason, then the leftovers came to me, and then I suppose they came to you. <laughs> I've heard of sloppy seconds, not sloppy seconds. I was in the black void next to them. I, I lost my sex appeal somewhere. I think I was in um, Sevastopol. I don't know. It was just gone. But uh, no, all you hear are my movie. <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, that that Momoa. I tell you what. You guys know I love you. Insert name. I love you. Insert name. Oh, baby. But he is a handsome devil, though, isn't he? He is. He's sexy. Dead sexy. Dead sexy. Dead sexy. Dead sexy. Dead sexy. Yeah. I'll tell you. Let me ask some questions, sorry. Let me ask some questions. <laughs> well, I had a, fan, I had a fanboy moment last week. I met the new Spartacus. The Mano, 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 I don't know what his last name is. Uh, he's a Maori guy from New Zealand. Holy moly. It's just like, I'm going, my God, what do you do? Do you do anything else besides work out? Man, uh, this guy is, and if you ever get to see him, and he goes to, to these conventions every once in a while, if you ever get to see him, the nicest fellow you will ever, ever meet. Besides me. No, he's the nicest, he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's it, it, just sort of like, totally unlike his character. He's just he's really <coughs> Anyway, that was my fanboy moment. There you go. Now, there's a question. Yep, question at the mic. Um, I'd like to thank Peter and Gary for helping with the auction last night. You guys were super. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Cliff, I know you do the pit bull rescue charity thing. Do any of the rest of you have a favorite charity that you help or support? Or? Uh, I don't officially uh, consistently support a charity, but uh, I've had a foster child for gotta be like 15 years now, same kid. Uh, and SPCA, we, we have dogs, I love dogs, so it would be uh, SPCA if it was going to be one for me. I, uh, I've consistently supported and uh, worked for the Canadian Mental Health Association to do a lot of, uh, uh, just do a lot of turn, uh, golf tournaments and things for them. And I also uh, do a lot with pads and personal assistance, dogs, because I'm a big time animal lover myself. And, uh, like to help out where I can, so pretty consistent on that one. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I have a similar thing with a you know ongoing foster, uh, uh, two foster childs. Um, one outgrew our needs. <laughs> we don't have to help them anymore. But uh, there's really Doctors Without Borders and uh, Habitat for Humanity are the ones that are ongoing. <laughs> And then there's the uh, Stargate Actor Retirement Fund. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big one for that. You're, you're supporting right now. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I have noticed that you guys have a couple Starbucks cups up there. I just wanted to know how much caffeine are we drinking this morning? Uh, uh, I was. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, please carry on. Come on, after you. I, was chipping down. Right, I, I had a venti drip this morning at uh, 7 a.m. I then straight after that had a tall drip, and now I'm onto my second venti drip. Hey, Look at me shake. <laughs> It'd be great if Starbucks did serve liquor. Like if you just spike your drink they're or something. Start, they're going starting yeah, to. Yeah, they're going There's to actually start start there in Atlanta that, right? that do. Yeah. Where? It's a, they ha they have some here in Atlanta that yep. do. It's wine, wine and beer. <laughs> Wine, wine and beer, not liquor. Spike liquid. them? Yeah. They're going to turn into cafes. Yeah. Yep. I, I, think, I think basically it comes from uh, when you're on set, there's always a point in the day where there's a Starbucks run. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times it's somebody who's lost a bet that has to pay for coffee for the whole crew. And uh, that's a pricey day. Oh. <laughs> you lose that bet. That's yeah, there's a, there's, there's a particular guy I'm trying what, what is what his truck is called, but this guy's got a smile on his face every day. The guy brings the truck to the set. Yep. Oh, because, yeah. you know, I mean, you're, you're talking four to six hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just like soup. <laughs> the film coffee truck is the greatest job in the world. Yeah, yeah. I know you, they, they, they go around from set to set. They, 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 they nail almost the entire crew with coffees and smoothies and stuff. And they just travel around. And by the end of the day, you know, you've racked up about 10,000 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm in the wrong business. You just make coffee. Well, the guy who, who used to do it, the, the Chinese fellow, used to come around. He's retired. He's only 40. He's just totally retired. That's awesome. So, uh, I'm, actually, every day. I'm actually kind of curious. What, what kind of bet would you possibly lose that would cost you a Starbucks run for everybody? And you're just going to have to tell us a little more about that. Actually, here's the story. Uh, it, it, I used to have... Uh, the Friday lottery on set. Uh, every every Friday, because we usually film Monday to Friday, uh, on, on Friday there'd be a lottery where some people come around with literally a Ziploc bag, clear bag, so you could see all the money. And it was like $5 Friday. So everybody put in, you buy a lottery ticket for five bucks, at the end of the day, after the last shot, they pull a name, and you were handed a sack of cash, right? So just before we were gonna do our summer break, it, dub it was doubled. $10 Friday. We're like, oh my God. And you Fine. kept asking because, you know, oh, it's up to 500 bucks, it's up to 800 bucks. It went up to uh, <laughs> just shy of $1,800. Yeah. And I swear this, this story is true. <laughs> I'm about to buy my ticket, okay? And then Gilmore's there. And he goes, uh, he goes, they ask him first. He goes, oh, I don't have any money. I said, well, I'm going to buy one. He goes, well, let me, can I just borrow 20 bucks and buy, I'm going to buy two tickets? I'm like, yeah, sure. Then I buy my ticket right after him. <laughs> I get wrapped early, I go home, I get a call from Gilmore. And he goes, can you give me a ride back to set? Because I just won $1,800. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me. 
So we had made a bet, me, him, and Louie, that if any of us won, you gotta take the other two guys out for dinner. It cover everything. Booze, food, everything. Then, oh. <laughs> so we made him go into the keg, but I think I had lobster, <laughs> shots. And then the bill comes and I go, yeah, can I get my 20 bucks back? And he goes, oh no, I just brought a credit card. It's the way it works. I mean, you know, these guys, that's, that's how they get rich. At, at least you guys on Atlantis used to, to like, do a lottery. We would do the lottery, but our money would just go straight to Joe Malosi. It was basically just paying him every Friday for the, you know, for the privilege, for the privilege of being us. You know, I was, I've been in that $5 Friday for decades. I have never, ever won. And the amazing thing, it, it, I've been around those for a while, and I have never seen an American win. <laughs> Oh, I've seen it happen. I, I, I saw once a, uh, a, a girl who was a production, a locations, uh, locations assistant who showed up one day as a day player. Oh, and she put in the five, uh, the five dollar Friday and she won it. You know, we've been all donating every week and week. This girl comes in for one day and she went the biggest payday of her life. And then there was one guy who, who, who won the, uh, the five dollar Friday that week before, and then the following week, which was the end of the run. That's when it gets big. End of the season, it was a $20 one, okay. and he won that one too. So he walked away with like 5,000 bucks, and I just went, you, how can you win twice? Fix, it's gotta be a fix. <laughs> I mean, but, it, but it wasn't, it just, it's just the luck of the draw, and I'm like, I never win. Never, I, and I've been doing this for years, and I know, I know. Oh, yeah. It's sad, but. That's the way it goes. Do we have another question? That's all very sad. I hear a question on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, this is actually for Mr. Amendola. Can you talk a little bit about Continuum? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 this is about Stargate. That's right. <laughs> Continuum. Wow. I haven't been on it, so I don't want to hear about it. Uh, <laughs> hey, it airs down here pretty soon, right? It is, uh, well, you know, Cliff was on, of course, Stargate Continuum. He was the guy. So that was pretty cool. Uh, this is not that. This is uh, just very quickly, because uh, Cliff is right. This is Stargate. Uh, no, 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 you are. Uh, um, it's a series we shot in Vancouver last winter, and we shot 10 episodes, and uh, it's been picked up by Sci-Fi UK and Sci-Fi USA, so it'll start airing in uh, January. But it's primarily 2077, governments have failed, so we have corporate governments. In contrast to that, there's an Occupy-like movement, which unfortunately is quite violent. And so the premise of, of this is, uh, on their execution day, they are transported to 2012 Vancouver, along with a police officer, a female, Rachel, uh, Rachel Adams. Uh, and she tries to basically track them down as they figure out a way to get back and, and how they affect the present or the future, etc. And it, Lexa Doig is in it, Roger Cross is in it, there's a, a lot of Stargate faces that you recognize, and it's uh, Simon Barry, and one other just quick thing, the guy, Jeff King, who's another producer, wrote the first episode of Stargate that I was in. Uh, so I, I wondered for the longest time how I got this job, I just kept wondering, you know, I, I don't know these guys, you know? And it, I, I imagine it was probably through Jeff, but uh, anyway, do watch. Because you have talent. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> do we have someone else on the mic? On the question? <clears throat> oh, up there. Hey Nick, try to run toward him real quick so we don't, don't have dead space there. Has anyone watched the Tug Turner video yet? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. This question, what this question is for everybody. What was something you wanted to do with your character, or, or asked to do with your character, that the writers or directors would not let you do? Love scene. <laughs> I would offer repeatedly. Uh, what do you think Brody should get set? No. See, I had people volunteer, like Julia Benson's like, yeah, I'm into it, and I'm like... <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, I know the feeling, Peter. <laughs> I never got the girl either. But, uh, no, I, I, I always wanted to, uh, well, I, I guess I shot myself when I did it. I said, when do I go to space? I want to go into space have my own ship. So they said, okay, well, uh, yeah, we'll put you in space. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be a great idea. 
I'm gonna blow you up! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, I, I, I wanted a love scene as well, and that was the only thing I ever asked him. I, I'd say to him, guys, it would be such a great scene between Baal and Vana. Yeah. It, would be, it would be cool. They just, they never went for it. We got pretty close to it, you know, a little kiss there, but that was about it. <laughs> well, Jeez, what, stay, what goes on backstage stays. Yeah. I kept trying to sell them on a strip poker scene with Don Davis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had to put that in. <laughs> that's, that's when I really appreciated my Jaffa outfit because there are a lot more layers. <laughs> Interesting and had layers, and I was just wondering how protective of you were your characters. Did did they ever want you to do something that you didn't think your character would do, or say something you didn't think your character would say? Oh yeah. Uh, I don't think I told the story the other day yet. Um, before our summer break, <coughs> stop me if I told the story. I don't think I did. Uh, wait, just uh, the day before our summer break. Uh, Carl Binder comes up. I didn't tell a story, did it? The shower scene thing? No, no? Okay. He comes up and he goes, uh, so you, just the day before our big summer break, right? Look, you get a month, over a month off, right? You're looking forward to it, get a break. And he comes up and he goes, oh, just so you know, uh, the first episode back, uh, Brody's gonna have a shower scene. I'm like, what, what, what? And he goes, uh, yeah, and I'm not usually the guy they call for uh, shower scenes. You know, they call Gary, they call Gary for the shower scene. <laughs> So I'm like, oh man, and I'm all panicky, right? And then, oh God, just, so all summer I'm working out, to just, no burgers, beer, nothing. It's horrible. I get to set and uh, you know, I must say it was looking pretty good. Looking pretty good. And it's, it's so embarrassing, the shower scene. It's like the whole crew's there and literally, the war, poor wardrobe gal has to come in and give you a little thong thing with a butt floss thing to wear, right? And she's like, She's looking away, she's like, which one do you want? I don't know, I don't know I guess, I don't know. In a large. Um, but anyways, you get there and they open up the shower seat and the whole crew's behind us. And Grizz, the camera guy, he eventually have to drop the robe and, and all I hear Grizz go, uh. So I do the shower seat, it's done. and. And about two weeks later, we're at lunch, and Carl Biner comes up and he goes, Oh, just so you know, we had to cut the shower scene. <laughs> oh, they're so cruel. <laughs> I've never had to do a shower scene. No, I, I, I actually, uh, very, I was very happy the way my uh, character was treated, except, well, there was one incident. Um, when they first hired me to play uh, Chekhov, uh, they asked me how my Russian was. And I, I said, what do you mean, how's my Russian? And, I said, and they said, well, because this character speaks Russian. I said, well, I don't speak Russian. And he goes, no, it's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna get a, a teacher to come and teach you how to speak Russian. So I said, okay. So I, uh, I spent three weeks learning this Russian. And another story. I got on. I got on the uh, on stage, and um, and Peter Deloise, who was directing the episode, uh, came up to me and he says, "Ah, the show's too long. We're going to have to cut the Russian." <laughs> I said, "I just spent three weeks learning all this Russian, and you're going to cut it?" And he goes, "Yes." No goddamn way I'm going to do this scene in Russia. He says, I don't care. No, we're not going to use it. I says, you are going to use it. I spent a three goddamn weeks learning this, and we're going to keep it in. And so I went on set, and we did the whole scene. It was beautiful. It was all in Russian. And then the show came out, and yeah, they cut it. <laughs> they actually didn't cut all of it. They cut about two-thirds of it. But uh, it was... Uh, that was the only thing that uh, that I really fought hard against. But most most everything that was uh, was quite good. There were a few occasions where they'd give me things to say that uh, were impossible for a Russian speaking person to say, you know, and make it palatable. Mm -hmm. But um, 
Other than that, no, I was quite happy with the way our, my character went on that show. Cool. Well, on that note with Peter as well, I had an incident with Peter. Also, only one small incident, but it's, it was very funny. Um, there was one scene, my ship was being blown up, whatever, an explosion was going off. So Peter comes up to me. Peter's a great guy, he's a great director, but when you get an actor who becomes a director, sometimes they slip into acting and they want to act for you. And I was not going to let that happen. And anyway, Peter said to me, Cliff, all right, when that explosion goes off, I want you to scream. So I just looked at him, I'm like, what? He's like, no, I want you to scream when that explosion goes off. I said, no. <laughs> I said, number one, Baal does not scream. <laughs> 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 defend my character in any shows that I've done, but this was the one time, because Bobo was, you know, he was, you know, a character. And I can see it though. I won't slap him, but <laughs> so anyway, so Peter says, you're not going to scream? I said, no Peter, I'm not going to scream. He's like, oh, okay. Uh, I said, I'll react to it, of course, you know, I'm not going to scream, you know. So yeah, the, the one cameraman came up to me when Peter left the set, and he's like, you're not going to scream, are you? I'm like, no, he said, go. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only time. It was pretty cool, but Peter was genuinely shocked that I was saying, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. It was very funny. It's funny, because Peter, Peter told me about that. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he could, you wouldn't scream. He said, that fucking cliff. <laughs> I wasn't going to use it. But I figured if I had it, I could threaten him with it that I was going to put it on YouTube if he didn't do what I told him to do the next 10 times. That's actually Peter. That's, That's probably Peter. what he was thinking. <laughs> he used it against me somewhere because Peter was the one, and I'm sure you've all heard about it somewhere, my first convention in Germany, Peter was the one who made me take my shirt off and do tequila shots. Uh, <laughs> on the floor. And of course there was photographs, everything it was crazy. It was unbelievable. And he you was know, at a convention was every weekend. He made a lot of money, but I <laughs> That's right. And that year he did so many conventions that it was just shocking. <laughs> no, no, you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I have to admit, uh, one, one of the things about being a recurring guy is you get the downtime, so you get to experience, if you're lucky, you work. <laughs> you're watching the talk video, aren't you? That's what you're doing. I'm trying to figure out what they're, 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 they're oh, passing this phone around and you hear. Oh, look at that! Oh, no, what the hell are they doing out there? It's the tub. Have you seen it? It is oh, awful. It's terrible. That's not going anywhere. That's it. That is embedded. You see that once, that's not fantastic. Going anywhere. Wow. One of my plays. <laughs> Okay, so theoretically, obviously, in the event of a zombie apocalypse, which character would you take to have your back from any of the Stargates, and why? I think Anubis, because they wouldn't be able to eat his face, right? Uh, I, uh, Julia Benson, because we'd have to repopulate the world, so I would It would just be my duty, really. Okay. I'd maybe say the replicators, because they're going to be a hell of a lot faster than zombies. You know, I, I'd say they'd attack them pretty well. I am Chekhov. I don't need no sticking back up. <laughs> You guys have um, a relationship, I'm sure, with your writers and producers. Um, I'm specifically curious about, with their influence over your careers that they have, what your relationship with the writers is, and if you have any stories or anecdotes about that. The writers. Writers, no, they're, they're like little gnomes who live in caves, and when they come out, they go, then sort of scuttle away. <laughs> no, I love them. You know, it's really, it's really odd. I mean, I, I admire actors who have the ability to go in and sit down and, and strike up a relationship. I've never had that. I've never really gone in. I never. The only writer I really spoke to was Brad. You know, Brad was the only one, and he wrote 
but that was more as a, a you know producer and things and, and I've always admired that but I've never been comfortable I always feel as soon as I sit down that the communication is there's a there's another motive in the room there's a big elephant which is you know I want more I want this to happen and it's always made me rather uncomfortable so I I, I never did it but it's something I have to work out you know me and Gilmore used to be up there so much, I think they'd ask us to leave. <laughs> All the time, we'd be hanging out there. Just, you know, shooting the shit kind of thing. we just let going up. Um, but I always found that if, if they would let it, at least I felt this way, they'd let us try something, especially in a rehearsal just before they'd shoot, and sometimes it ended up in, in the final product. And uh, one time that happened, Carl Binder had written the episode. It was when Volker was about to go under for surgery for his kidney, and... Uh, all it said was that the music's supposed to start and I, I'm, I can't, I have trouble turning it off and th that, that's it. It was kind of a nothing moment and in the rehearsal, I just delayed the turning off and then I couldn't turn it off so I delayed, looked at everybody and just, and then pulled out the batteries and they dropped on the ground and, the, and I just hear this laugh from the back and then uh, Carl came in and he goes, hey, do that again. <laughs> you know, it's funny because sometimes work a good work can come from interaction, you know, from saying, hey, can, can you write this? No, well, how about this? And then an idea comes from it. And that can happen. But a lot of the time, good work happens and very little is said. That they somehow, you, you get onto the writing, I mean, you, you, you really commit yourself to the writing, and they let you do your work. So there's not too much micromanaging. I mean, the, the reason you're in the room partially is because you write for the role. And uh, I think the better directors do that. It's actually, as an actor sometimes, uh, there was one uh, director in particular who I dreamed of working with, you know, because you, you always think someone else has the answer. That you can, there's just this little mis a missing thing, and, it, and when they give it to you, then everything will become clear. And I remember going in, and the director never said anything to me. And then you realize, hey, he likes it, you know, and uh, it's funny, it's funny. I, the, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I've really spent any time, I, I mean, I know a lot of writers who write shows and things like that. But on shows that I've worked on, I've not really had any uh, contact with them except for to say, can I see more of me, please? Can I have more of me in this show? Or, you know, in, uh, in jest. But uh, in, in general, I'd like to trust what the, uh, what the writers do and what they put down. And uh, occasionally you'll find something that seems out of character for, for, uh, for, for your character in a, in a show and you want to make a comment about, well, I don't think I would say that. I mean, you can offer the suggestion, but I usually trust the writers that, that they, they, they have what I want to do and it's my job to make sure that I do their words justice. And that's, that's basically what what we do. Their job is to write, my job is to make their words look good. Yeah, I mean, I, I started off in soap opera and I, that was the only time that we, we had a good relationship with the writers because you're in a show every single day for whatever I was on for six years and um, you do interact with the writers a lot about your character because it's a daily thing and, and you start to get to know your character so well uh, but what you've got to think about with them as well as, as, as Gary was saying, I ask them, like, why are they writing that? Because they're thinking of an entire arc, either for the season or for the episode or whatever. And when too many people start getting involved in, well, I should say that, I should say that, especially in soap opera, opera whatever you say affects everyone else in the show. So you have to know why they want you to say that and then work around that. If they have no reason, then you can change it. But if they have a reason because somewhere in the series someone else is going to say something about it. So it gets very bitty, and like, like Tony's saying, you don't want to micromanage, so let them do their job. If they give you a line, you as the actor come up with a way to say that line that's going to fit in with your character. Be sarcastic, be whatever. You know? So yeah. But then, then Stargate, the guys were fantastic, the writers. I never went up to them. They, right in the beginning, saw how I wanted to play the character of Val, and they started writing for me. Uh, they saw, they, they were very good. I never had to go up to them once and say, guys, uh, you know, anything. So it was great. Question on the mic? Any questions? For real on the hangover panel, if I have a question in the corner. Up front. Right there. Oh, yeah. oh, um, we got somebody. We'll I've been to a lot of panels for the start date for like four years, and I always like to ask this one. Um, in a lot of interviews, what's your favorite question to get asked? <laughs> <laughs> that one. <laughs> 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just kind of like when you get asked about things that happened, uh, not necessarily on camera, but the behind the scenes stuff that, because that's the stuff that, that fans don't really get to hear. This is the stuff that actors tell other actors. So that's the part I like, because we get to share the stuff that made us crack up. That's my favorite stuff to share. Like this. Uh, one time. <laughs> We were doing a scene, we were on the, the bridge of the destiny, and it was, uh, we were being attacked by drones, so there's massive explosions and uh, suicide hits in the ship, so there's massive turbulence. And when they would film turbulence, they'd do it one of, kind of three ways. Sometimes the camera itself, the cameraman would shake it himself. Other times the actor would, they'd ask us to kind of bounce around a bit, sometimes it's a combination of both. So you had to listen to what they were asking. And I guess I didn't hear them, but I guess the, the, they just wanted us to be still in this one shot. The camera was going to move a little bit. So all, everybody else heard this except me. <laughs> so when they yelled action, this is what they saw. What are you doing? <laughs> I had Tony. We had something like that. <laughs> I'm sitting on my throne and the ship shaking, and you're, and you're sitting and you're doing these slow movements. But I see one of the guys, like the extras are coming to play, you know, the big soldier guys or whatever. He's standing like dead still. <laughs> And I'm sitting on the throne and shaking, you know, and explosions are happening, and he's just like, <laughs> But thank God, I mean, it's, you know, suits of the character, I'm sitting there with a half smile, and you know, it was actually real. It was fine, nobody, I don't think he was really on camera, but for me to see that was funny. <laughs> you just mentioned extras, uh, this is the funniest extra moment that we ever <laughs> saw. It was a scene where they're doing a lottery, because we're about to, the ship's, drifting into a sun, everybody's gonna die, there's a lottery, but there's only like, I think it was 20 spots on the shuttle, that's it. So we're all in the gay room, there's hundreds of extras in there, and one extra is, is military, so he's gotta got know that, and acting real tough. And at the end of it, they go, uh, Peter DeLuise was like, okay, and at the end, everybody who's left in the gay room, you're very upset, because you're gonna die. You're gonna die in the sun. So it'll be hot when you die. <laughs> so everybody, just I want you to be obviously down and upset that you're gonna die. So everybody leaves and it's a shot from above and this is honestly what this guy did. <laughs> <laughs> Watching, watching the guy who played the Hawaiian detective, what's his name, with the mustache? Magnum P.I. I was watching an episode of Kojak one day, and Magnum P.I. showed up as an extra on Kojak as a policeman with the mustache and the hair and the uniform hat. He looked a bit silly. But he was, that was the same thing. And he, he did this. He didn't say anything, but he went like this. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just thought it was very funny. But then when I, when I saw Magnum, and I saw, I went and I saw the Kojak, and going, I went, oh my god, that was Magnum. That was him. And it was awful. But it was very funny, but you never know. Uh, my favorite question is, 
where did you learn how to speak Russian? <laughs> I hear it all the time, and I, it, it, it's, it's, you know, everybody, some people come and say, I never knew you weren't Russian. It's so surprising that you speak with, a, like, a regular voice. And it's like, I knew the whole time. It happens. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's difficult. It's lots of fun to play Russian, because Russian guys, you know, they get to say things and do things and get away with it. You know, you can do that. You can cover up bad acting with very strong accent. <laughs> My name's kind of like, I mean, as you know, what's it feel like to die? <laughs> I've died so many times, I actually have a death reel at home. Like every single show I'm on, I die. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that's the question, you know. It feels good. <laughs> no, you do try to die interesting. I have a great friend, my favorite uh, guy who has, uh, he has, he calls himself the crying man. And I said, what do you mean? What's up, John? He said, oh, God, man, I'm working like hell. I said, well, how, you know, how's it going? What you doing? He said, well, you know, I just figured out how to cry. I just realized that just so every role, every audition I go in for, I just figure out a way sometime during the audition to cry. <laughs> and yeah. he, they're so shocked because it's a guy, you know? And sure enough, he put together a reel of the various things he's been asked to do. And in each one, it was so... The tears. So, it's so, so funny. But I, I have to say, it, it was the oddest question I've ever been asked that... I was at a convention one time, and uh, uh, a woman uh, passed, actually it was in a note, she passed me a note, and she said, uh, the note said, I went through the Stargate last night. If you're interested in discussing it, I am in room. I went in your room. Let's go through the gate together, That's right. shall we? I was flattered, but... <laughs> <laughs> I remember Brian J. Smith told me a story when he got Stargate and, and had been on for a while. And one of his friends, actual friends, seriously asked, an adult, seriously asked, and goes, So when you go through the gate, like, does it, does it hurt? <laughs> but you know, one, one thing about the gate is very, very interesting. You can tell they like your character when they let you go through the gate. Either one of two things are happening either you're going to die and never go back. You know, and, and they have to have you go through the gate, or they, because often, sometimes they'll have you walk through and you get the wonderful puddle effect, or they have you walk up to it, they cut away to Gary and the uh, control, and you're gone. Because every time you walk through the gate is a serious amount of money. <laughs> so, there was always, I thought, oh, I, they must have hated me. I've never went through the gate. <laughs> I've, I've looked at it, but I've never been through it. It was fun, but it hurt a little. <laughs> I feel like an electric gold. <laughs> I, I remember we were on set, one of the other actors were like, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad that, uh, you know, at least one of the characters, like, didn't have, uh, like, a pet with them that maybe would have been, and, like, me and Louie were like, of course you can't have a pet at Destiny. Okay, what are you going to do with the dot shit? Okay, open the gate. And there'd be some horrible gate on some planet somewhere and just bags of dog shit flying through it. Why are they doing this? Turn it off! Look! That's like one day's worth! You know, it's funny, years ago I, I was at a convention and right next to me there was uh, an astronaut, one of the, one of the Challenger guys. Right? It was very interesting. I went and did my panel, and there were a lot of people, and I went to hear his panel. And there really weren't that many people. And so the next day I said, guys, we haven't been in space. This guy has been in space. I think you might want to check him out. So I, I go back again because he was a great guy, and I part of his panel was exactly on that, on what happens to the waste <laughs> in space. And the, waste uh, in space. The urine. The urine. They just release, and it sort of crystallizes instantly. It's quite, quite beautiful, but the poop is all <laughs> you know? So I'm thinking, mm, maybe that's why people didn't, didn't come, so. <laughs> Some guy designed that toilet, you know. That's right. He's on uh, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> 
Yeah. You, wanted, you didn't want to be there for the previous designs of that toilet that didn't work? <laughs> ah, all right, let's get back to this on Monday. Let's just take the weekend off. I am so looking forward to hearing you guys answer from this question. Um, if you guys could do anything that you could ever have imagined with no like limitations that like on oh, earthly limitations like gravity or whatever, what would you do and why? <laughs> that's, one of, that's one of the questions I'll remember when asked, what's the strangest? <laughs> Top toga with no gravity. <laughs> that's my friend. <laughs> with your friend. And a floating in space with tuck turners. I would like to... <laughs> Me and Peter with tuck turners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would just fly. I, I would just. I, I dream about flying. I was just like just like swimming. You know, you're swimming in the air, just like swimming. I was just gonna say that too. The dreams yeah. I have when you're flying, it's like you never want to wake up. He's like, this is awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> just like kick off the ground and yeah, just, exactly. I just the same dream. Yeah, that's kind of cool. But not high, just low, like just low. You know, just cruising. yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's funny riding. I realize I've been here four days now, and the first time you go in Marriott, the open. Uh, open elevator and it's about, what, 50 floors and, and you go down and you, it's a little sort of disconcerting, you know, but riding down this morning, it was so great and I had, for some reason, I was just watching coming down and it felt, felt like I was in control, it felt like I was just floating. <laughs> I, I, I said, oh, I've been at Dragon Con too long. <laughs> I'm actually, um, I'm actually living with Dolce Vita right now, so... No, I, the things are going quite well, but if I, if I had anything that I'd really like to do, it's um, fly a jet fighter into space. I, uh, I think that would be the, the coolest thing. My, my buddy uh, did that in Russia with a MiG-29. He spent 10 days flying a fighter uh, in the you know, Russian Air Force fighter jet. And uh, took it right into space, right, in, right at the upper reaches of the atmosphere, like 150,000 feet or something. And he said you could see the sky was black and you could curve the curve of the Earth. And said it was the ultimate coolest thing. And when you when you went down, you could feel himself coming out of the chair and see, see his little uh, pen float. And he went, dude, you have never felt anything like it, man. It's just like the ultimate high. And when you take that fighter and you're holding the stick in your hand and you just move your hand like tick, like this, and the fighter goes tick, 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 tick. And he's going like 500, 800 miles an hour. And I'm going, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. But you know how much it costs? It costs about $40,000 for about four flights that last about 20 minutes each over 10 days. And you have to do a physical, go through all the rigors of, you know, high stress with the flight suit and everything. You may fail. And uh, so the weekend, uh, or that week cost him, I think around $50,000 and I thought, well, I don't want to fly that badly, but if I had unlimited, if I had unlimited cash, I think I would love to do that. It uh, looks like a lot of fun. You know, but this whole flying thing is very, very interesting, and uh, I think it would be the ultimate sort of school trip. I think every student should get that eye into space and ride right at that, right at that atmospheric split between the two. And I think it would change the world, it would change completely, change the world to get a sense of, of of just that we are a part of something and how much there really is. You know. They had this weekend, they had the, uh, in, in memory of Neil Armstrong, uh, his life story and all that kind of stuff. And what, I mean, just listening to him talk, when they were up on the moon, just looking back at the earth, how small it is and how fragile and how beautiful, it kind of makes you realize that it's exactly that. Every new generation should be able to see that little jewel, you know, it's fragile. We have time. It's all we got. It's all we got. I haven't heard this one asked because we kind of try to ask it every year to the guests. If you could have a Stargate-themed tattoo, 
what would you get? Where would it be? And of course, why is kind of included? I would have two big balls hanging. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'd have a big tattoo like on, on the side of my thigh, like two bull balls. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Giant hunk and testes. <laughs> I defer to my previous suggestion that you decide on a costume for us. <laughs> you decide on a tattoo for us and you place it. <laughs> At SGM track on Twitter. <laughs> tattoos, a uh I I don't get tattoos, I never understood them, but if I were to have a tattoo, uh, I'd probably get a, a gift <laughs> or something, I don't know, I, uh, I've, I've never, it's never really entered my mind of, uh, of a tattoo. I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> None of us have tattoos. None of us have, no. Really? I would, um... <laughs> I'll reference my shower scene, if anybody can find it. Uh, I, I, I get like the outline of the Destiny, because I always thought that was the coolest looking ship I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, uh, and our, on our, both on our t-shirts for the crew gifts and the, the dog tags that we have, the these things here. I mean, the outline of the ship is there, and uh, that's probably what I do. Well, awesome. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you guys for getting up early on Monday morning for our birthday. celebrity guest this weekend. This is our last Saturday. And especially to Tony Amendola, Chris Simon, Peter Chubb, Peter Simon. Thank you very much.